And welcome to the 12th meeting in 2021 of the Finance and Public Administration Committee. The first item on our agenda is to take evidence from the Deputy First Minister on Public Service Reform and the Christie Commission. Members have received a background paper from the clerks. Mr Swinney is joined today by Scottish Government officials Laura Turney and David Milne. I welcome our witnesses to the meeting and invite the Deputy First Minister to make a short opening statement. Thank you, Convener. I welcome the Committee's interest in the Christie Commission and the issue of public service reform. In this 10th anniversary year of the Commission's report, it is timely indeed to reflect on what has been achieved and its continued strategic, ethical and practical relevance. The Christie Commission report in 2011 set out a clear approach about how we could address the long-standing challenges around aligning our budgets across outcomes and making real-world impacts on people's lives. The report set out some key and aspirational principles about how public services needed to be shaped and delivered in future in order to meet the expected financial, demographic and other pressures. When our Government responded to the Christie report in the September of 2011, we worked with these principles and built a long-term commitment to public service reform underpinned by the pillars of preventing negative outcomes, working in partnership, outcomes-based performance making the most of our people, including frontline staff and communities themselves, and more recently with an emphasis on place. A range of progress has been made since the report was published. The ambition, the commitment and the principles continue to live large in the minds and the actions of those of us in public services across national and local government, across our public services and across the third sector. Indeed, a decade on, the term Christie remains the common language of reform and has been a cornerstone of our collective reflections on the experience of the pandemic, continuing to help to provide direction, direction and inspiration for what we now need to do to address these issues. The ambition is huge, and there are many examples of reform in action that we can point to. While this includes some structural reforms, the impact of Christie has been more evident in influencing and reshaping how both national policy and local service delivery have been built on improving outcomes making a tangibly positive difference to people's lives. We regularly see some or all of the pillars of reform featuring as ingredients in how these policies and services are shaped and implemented. However, despite the many examples that we can point to, reform is not yet as deeply embedded at the heart of policy making and service delivery as it needs to be. It is not yet as systemic as I would like it to be. Um, the, we have to ask ourselves uh, the questions about why that is the case. Uh, as your committee's previous witnesses have said, making a concerted shift to reform is very challenging, and there are many reasons for this. Uh, a key point, as we saw during the pandemic, is that there were places where these, uh, during the pandemic where these barriers were transcended, um, and traditional and embedded ways of developing policies and delivering services were revised um, ab uh, abruptly and swiftly and perhaps we need to do more of that in the period ahead. The committee will have heard me say often, and this is critical, that we need our public services to wrap around what matters to people, to be person-centred, holistic, responsive to their needs, rather than to expect people to fit around what public services offer and navigate complicated systems from positions of vulnerability and need. This isn't straightforward, it is difficult and time-consuming, but I am mindful of the observations and insights of your previous witnesses in tackling this issue. Um, this challenge is um, as pressing for us within the Scottish Government as it is for uh, other public services. When I assumed my current responsibilities after the election, the First Minister asked me to make sure that as a Government we work across policy boundaries to secure policy solutions that can transform lives. That requires us as the Scottish Government to shift our thinking from portfolio-based to people-based solutions and, in the process, work across the organisation on common challenges and break down traditional policy silos. In other words, we need to build bridges and not erect walls in policy making. We need to respond to problems as they present to us, rather than to reframe them to suit our structures and processes. Our approach to COVID recovery has aimed to embody this way of working. Our COVID recovery strategy is built on three priority themes of uh, securing uh, ensuring financial security for low-income households, good green jobs and fair work, and well-being for children and young people. But these themes cannot be pursued in isolation. Success is contingent on working across silos, across policy ambitions, and building on the interconnections between them. 
The kind of COVID recovery we want to see goes beyond neutralising the negative impacts which the pandemic has caused and towards tackling, tackling complex and deep-rooted inequalities which too many communities in Scotland have experienced for generations. Uh, if we are to make that difference, then our public services need to work fundamentally around what matters for these people and uh, communities. In conclusion, Convener, the Government's commitment to Christie's vision and public service reform remains strong, but making Christie a reality requires a collective national endeavour, and I am committed to making that happen in the years to come. Thank you very much for that opening statement, which covered many of the areas in actual fact I was going to ask questions on. So I'll just kind of follow on from some of the areas I was uh, wishing to uh, ask you about. I, you know, in 2010, with the Public Service Reform Act and also Christie followed soon after. So the, a decade has elapsed, and you said in your opening statement, and I quote, there are many examples of reform which have made a tangible difference to people's lives. So I'm just wondering if you can touch on just one or two of the most significant of those? Okay, I think um, there are a number to, to, to choose from, Convener, but let me try to take some that reflect different elements of the reform programme. Um, at an element of structural reform, um, uh, my uh, firm belief is that the reforms that we undertook in relation to the creation of a single uh, police service uh, and a single fire and rescue service were reforms that were necessary and which have provided significant additional resilience, capacity and effectiveness to both the police and fire and rescue services uh, across the country. I think the reforms that we undertook, particularly in relation to policing, have attracted international commendation as reforms that have been appropriate for the changing nature of the policing challenge that we face. So that's an example of structural reform that has been undertaken. In relation to um, policy reforms, which uh, I think have been consistent with the work of Christie, uh, I would cite the two very significant developments and expansions of early learning and childcare, which have been about recognising the importance of early intervention in the lives of children and young people to ensure that they have the best possible platform for success. So the significant expansion on two occasions that have taken place of early learning and childcare, culminating in the move to 1140 hours in uh, August of this year, um, has been an example where we've put into practice the principle of um, early intervention uh, to ensure that children are given the best uh, platform for um, their, their lives. And I suppose, thirdly, um, I, I would cite a reform uh, such as the emergence of uh, the Young Persons Guarantee, where we essentially look at a whole range of different employment and training programmes and recognise that I suppose each one of them individually has got their justification and their, their arguments for. But fundamentally, what has been demonstrably proven to be the case is that if you give a commitment to young people of a route that enables them to progress from school into whatever field lies beyond school, whether it's in work or college um, or further training, um, you can provide a much clearer route for those individuals and therefore the outcome that is achieved is that we do not lose young people from the labour market or from positive participation in society. So again, that's a policy reform which is about improving outcomes as a consequence of the way in which we design programmes. So those are just three examples, Convener. I, I, could, I could go through some more. But, uh... OK, thank you very much. That's, that's actually very helpful. Um, you, you will have obviously uh, read the official report from the session we had three weeks ago when we uh, um, um, took evidence from uh, three academics who did express some frustration uh, where progress was not being made. So, for example, one of those areas is the area of preventative uh, spend. I mean, um, Christie Commission said it um, well. Sorry, in the response to Christie Commission, the Scottish Government said it would reform our public services through a decisive shift towards prevention, greater integration at a local level driven by better partnership, uh, workforce development, a sharper, more transparent performance, uh, focus on performance. But 
Um, they are of the view that that really hasn't happened. Um, now, there's strong reasons for that. It's very difficult, uh, particularly in financially uh, challenging circumstances, to uh, encourage organisations to disinvest in one area in order to invest in another. But they are of the view that there doesn't even seem to be a, a kind of definition of what prevention even means in, in the public sector in Scotland at this at this time. So how can we take that uh, crucial area forward, and how can we deliver the culture change which uh, ten years ago, when you led on this particular issue, uh, we all agreed was uh, very um, important in actually changing attitudes and, and ensuring that prevention actually delivered for the people of Scotland. I, 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 I don't agree with the point that, um, that uh, prevention is, is, is not well understood or not well applied. Um, I think the principle of prevention is very clearly understood. I've given the committee the example of early learning and childcare. You know, I, I think it would be widely, uh, if not universally, accepted that the earliest moment in which you can provide formal um, engaged um, uh, learning and childcare opportunities for children will be for the advantage of those children, which will give them the best start in life. So, um, now, as an example of a programme that's been delivered, um, our local authority partners um, have been 100% joined at the hip with us on implementing that programme. Um, We've agreed financial arrangements to once more well, once we've agreed the financial arrangements for so doing full on. So you know I think that's been a widely universally accepted uh, policy approach. That's one example. I think another example I would I would give is is in the field of youth justice, where if we go back to um, ten years ago, um, we were seeing um, really high numbers of young people going through the youth justice system um, and being prosecuted and ending up with uh, damaging criminal records. And what our justice colleagues did, and this wasn't just within government, this was a whole systems approach involving community justice authorities around the country, a range of third sector organisations, was essentially deploy early intervention. The work of organisations like the Violence Reduction Unit, for example, was uh, supported to make sure that we made the earliest possible intervention where we saw young people um, proceeding in a direction that was going to be damaging to society and, crucially, to their own well-being. Now, what we've seen over the, the period um, between 2008-9 and 2019-20 is an 85% reduction in the number of 12 to 17-year-olds proceeded against in Scotland's courts. Why? Because we've put in place earlier intervention to avoid the situation becoming as aggravated as we'd merit it going to a court. So I think that, for me, is, is probably one of the best examples, because in, in amongst those young people will be young people that can make a contribution to our society, but at some stage they, 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 they've face some difficulties and uh, potentially got themselves into trouble and, bluntly, a different approach from the state has resulted in those young people being able to make more of a, con a more positive contribution to society than would have been the case in the past. And that's about putting the principles of the Christie Commission uh, into practice in an operational way. I mean, I don't doubt for one minute there's been remarkable successes, actually, and you have, of course, said, um, uh, detailed those just now. But what about areas where cultural change uh, it does not seem to be happening to the same extent? I mean, how, how uniform is the cultural change? Because there are, you get remarkable examples, yet there are other areas. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you one. I mean, one of the things we, that, that, that caused us some concern uh, a decade or, or more ago was a high proportion of NH spend on uh, particularly older people being treated in hospitals who didn't need to be. We're talking at that time about £1.5 billion. Pounds. Now, obviously, we've had a pandemic, so things have been changed. But what, where are we in terms of trying to change the, the cultural approach in some uh, areas, such as, for example, the NHS? Because that was a particular area where you made a call. There was resistance from health boards who said, oh, well, unless we get more money, we can't actually change the way we, we, we do things uh, with the resources we have at this time. 
time, and I am aware that he allocated £500 million over three years specifically to preventative uh, spend at the time. So, I'm just, so it's about how can we actually ensure that some of these remarkably successful examples that you have illustrated uh, can permeate the entire public sector in Scotland? I, I, th I think, actually, in, in my last answer, I, 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 should have, um, I should have said for completeness, convener, that, um, that, that there will be areas which are much harder to, to penetrate than others. You know, so I've given you some examples where it's happened. There are other areas that are more challenging. Uh, I think the, one of the problems is that you know, I, I could sit here and I could, I could give a litany of examples of good practice, but I think I would struggle in all of them to say that they were systemic approaches. So they might be good examples, but I'm not sure they're happening everywhere, which in a sense brings me to responding to the question you just put to me, convener, about um, the appropriate care for individuals. I think we've made um, some very good progress on ensuring that people are receiving the care that is appropriate for their needs. But I live in the real world that today we have something like 14 to 1,500 people who are um, experiencing delayed discharge in our hospitals. Um, not, I think, because we are anybody in health and social care partnerships around the country is taking any view other than the fact that they are keen to make sure that people who are in hospital that could be accommodated at home with care packages are able to do so, I think what they often face is practical challenges in so doing. Some of those practical challenges might be about the availability of money. Uh, so there may not be enough money to afford all the social care packages that we would want to afford uh, at a local level because resources may be tied up in, um, if, if I call it, the more acute hospital settings. I don't think that's actually the problem we've got just now. The problem we've got just now, as I've explained to Parliament on a number of occasions, is the availability of staff to deliver social care packages in communities. There just aren't enough people on the ground available to do so. Um, in the mail at my house yesterday, um, we got a leaflet from a, a, a you know, much respected uh, local care provider um, a leaflet inviting people to come forward to join their social care staff. Now, I've, we've never had a leaflet that through our door before, but it indicates the, the lengths to which these care providers are going to try to encourage people to join the labour market because of the acute challenges that have been faced. So there will be, notwithstanding the... You know, I, come back, I come back to one of the points I made a moment ago. There will not be a health and social care partnership in the land that believes anything other than an individual should be accommodated in the most appropriate setting for them, and if that's a care package in their home, they will want to provide that. But there will be practical impediments to them being able to deliver that, and I think the most important practical impediment just now is the availability of people to deliver social care in our communities. Yeah, I mean, I think absolutely. I think demand is clearly increasing much uh, faster than the ability to provide uh, services. Uh, when people have to be trained, apart from anything else, you just can't magic uh, uh, professional uh, uh, and caring staff from, from nowhere. So I appreciate that. But does that not make it even uh, more important that we have the right conditions to support change and uh, meaningful collaboration? and um, uh, innovation, and, and how do we incentivise that in the, in the public sector? I, mean, I know fine well how it was incentivised in the private sector, where I worked uh, for, for many years, but how do we incentivise that? How do we actually make that happen? Because you touched on early learning, but early, early learning was supported by huge additional uh, funding from the Scottish Government, both in resource and in capital, so that makes change much easier. But in areas where we are in this kind of uh, difficult situation that we find ourselves, you know, with the, the perfect storm, of, 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 of staff who are, who are exhausted, and frankly, I don't think it helps when the media to, uh, recruitment when the media continually focus on how exhausted and worn out you know NHS staff. You know, I don't know how, how that encourages people to want to go into that uh, service particularly. But how do we actually deal with this 
in the kind of circumstances we're in at the moment and make kind of this kind of change if we're not to be in a situation next year and subsequent years where we're just in exactly the, the, the same situation, really, if not worse? I, I, I think philosophically, convener, um, the we need to encourage organisations to follow one of the principles that was in the Christie Commission, which is the principle of, of partnership and collaboration. So, uh, you know, there are various ways in which one could take forward an agenda of public service reform. Um, there could be an approach taken which is about structural change, and we've used those options in certain circumstances. In other circumstances, there is a route that can be taken forward which is around the theme of partnership and collaboration, where you establish the, um, the atmosphere, the motivations to encourage different public sector organisations that need to work together um, to, to do so effectively to, um, to meet the needs of individuals. So as an example of that, um, some time ago I visited um, the team at Perth Royal Infirmary, which obviously serves my local constituency. And there is a team, which is a joint team of health and local authority staff who are working in, from my recollection, a rather small room in Perth Royal Infirmary, very focused on the intelligence coming from the hospital about who was needing ready for discharge and working out between them what was the timescale and circumstances for discharge and therefore necessary support within the community. Now that to me was philosophically bringing to life what we're talking about, what I'm talking about here, whereby public servants from two different public bodies are working together in collaboration, focusing on individual cases and working out how best can we ensure that individual has a smooth journey out of hospital when it was required into their own home and to be well supported there to make their recovery? Um, so that's a, that, the route that was chosen there is collaboration. A different route could have been chosen. Um, there could have been structural reform undertaken there. Um, but I think the encouraging public serv servants to focus on the delivery of the best possible outcomes for members of the public is a, a really strong incentive for those individuals. Okay. How frustrating is it, uh, um, uh, Cabinet Secretary, um, that um, best practice isn't shared as much as it should? I mean, for example, in the Local Government Communities Committee in the last session, we looked at levels of sickness in local authorities and found that the best local authority uh, had a level of sickness only a quarter of that of the worst. Both SNP controlled councils, by the way, so wasn't you couldn't make a political argument on that. So, surely, the, uh, given the size and scale of Scotland, is it not frustrating that we are clearly um, strong methodologies uh, are um, in place that they're perhaps not being looked at and, and copied and implemented elsewhere, so that we can, in fact, mm -hmm. uh, for the limited resources that we have. Um, you know, take things forward in a much more positive way. It's a frustration, Kavir, and I, I think it's difficult to it's difficult to justify why that is the case. Um, and it's not just about um, some of the uh, examples of innovation. It can also be about examples of just service improvement, routine service improvement, where relatively straightforward steps can be taken to improve performance but are not widely taken forward by all public authorities. Um, so we, we do take a number of steps to, to try to address that. Um, uh, obviously, the, uh, the, the work that we take forward, for example, through the Scottish Leaders Forum is designed to bring together public authorities to, to learn lessons and to improve performance. There are specific organisations within the health service, which are designed to uh, deliver improvement across all boards. Um, local authorities have collaborated to establish the improvement service and to draw on the, le the lessons from the improvement service. Indeed, the, one of the propositions that we funded as a government was the, 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 the What Works Scotland um, venture, which was designed to apply academic analysis to some of the work that was undertaken to implement the Christie Commission 
and therefore to share that learning on a more widespread basis across the public sector systems. And that's obviously there for organisations to, 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 to tap into. Now, of course, as, as, as you will appreciate, Convener, uh, understandably, there are some areas of policy and delivery where ministers have more or less influence. Um, and uh, in, in local government, for example, um, the, the ministers do not operationally control local government, so it is a matter for how does local government respond to some of these challenges for their own democratic decision making. Um, and, uh, but in other public bodies, such as health boards, ministers have got much more um, direct uh, opportunities to apply obligations onto uh, health boards, for example, uh, to deliver performance. OK, last question from me, uh, um, Deputy First Minister, and then we'll open up uh, to colleagues around the table. And that's, um, you know, our witnesses um, three weeks ago said that uh, in the wake of COVID-19, it does prevent, present an opportunity to empower um, and um, better resource local communities. But what does that actually mean to the Scottish Government? What does empowering local uh, communities mean? Um, does it mean, you know, empowering the small groups within communities who tend to be active in community councils and elsewhere? Or how do you involve people uh, um, um, more widely? I mean, no participatory budgeting has been a step forward, for example. But what does uh, um, community empowering mean to Scottish ministers? I, 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 th I think it, what it means is about providing support to communities to be able to intervene and to act effectively in their own local communities. And that will vary around the country. Um, during COVID, um, a, an organisation, you know, a local hotelier in, a, in my constituency um, established a, an organisation called Felde Roo. Um, uh, uh, interestingly, a, a local resident phoned them up one day and said, I've just had a leaflet from Deliveroo. I think they've been doing something with your name, uh, which was an interesting way of looking at it all. Um, but this, was an or this didn't exist before COVID. This was a, 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 an individual, uh, Gavin Price, who owns a couple of uh, hotels and bars. Um, he had kitchens. There were people in Aberfeldy that needed hot meals and they were facing vulnerability. So he just got a, a squad of people together and with accessing some financial support from different bodies, it created a whole mechanism that went on throughout COVID, which involved delivering free meals to vulnerable individuals, within free hot meals of good quality to individuals within the community. Um, now, that is absolutely welcome. That's, of a, that's a level of fine grain intervention that can come about because people essentially feel there is something they can do to make a difference. He wasn't asked to do it by the local authority. Um, they certainly encouraged it and supported it. But it's an, yeah, and there are countless examples of that around the country um, in the space of COVID, but in other spaces, you know, for example, we see a number of... Uh, the Scottish Flood Forum supports a lot of organisations at local level uh, in providing some of the early intervention for householders in relation to flooding incidents that can take place in, 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 in local communities. They work with local authorities, they work with resilience partnerships, but they've decided to take the initiative to make sure they can be active in support of their communities. And so I think the, 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 the meaning of community empowerment for the government is about making sure people are enabled and supported to advance on propositions of that nature, rather than us sitting designing a, a, an elegant system of governance that I would venture to suggest designs an elegant system of governance, but not much else um, in terms of the practical effect on people's lives. Community involvement is also important. I was at a public meeting a week past Saturday in Lacranza, population 120, and there were 75 people actually at, at the meeting. Uh, so involvement is also important. OK, um, we'll open up our uh, two colleagues around the table, and the first person to ask questions will be Liz, to be followed by John. 
thank you very much. Good morning, Mr Swinney. Um, I want to ask uh, some questions around uh, some of the answers that you've just provided to the convener. And building on a comment that was made by Professor James Mitchell in the meeting that we had on the 9th of November, where he was very clear that there was a lot of um, really strong goodwill across the political spectrum for the Christie Commission, but 10 years on, we're uh, still asking why it all hasn't come together. And in that same session, the Auditor General, Stephen uh, Boyle, said that he felt that, uh, in some cases, the leadership in the public sector um, isn't being sufficiently held accountable for some of the decisions. And I just wondered if you could comment on that. Um, well, I, I certainly don't feel any lack of accountability. Um, and I don't think many other people feel lack of accountability. Um, uh, I think there's, a, you know, there's multiple accountability streams within our, our systems. Um, ministers are accountable to, to Parliament. Um, the members of Parliament are accountable to their electorates. The electorate to uh, make their choices. They just made one on the 6th of May. Um, and uh, public organisations, uh, local authorities are, are accountable to their electorates. The health boards are uh, accountable to ministers. Um, they are accountable through annual public meetings in their localities. So I, I don't think there's any lack of accountability. One of the points the Auditor General made, which I think is relevant on the question of accountability, is that some of the channels of accountability or the requirements of accountability or the accountability measurements that we have may not be helpful in trying to achieve some of the aspirations of the Christie Commission. So the convener asked me about um, a, 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 a discernible shift of resources to support prevention. Well, if, if there isn't the um, the, if the accountability mechanisms are in place to monitor and assure performance on certain aspects of public service delivery, it is difficult for public servants to move away from that mechanism to something else because there will be continued pressure on those existing accountability mechanisms. So do you, do you think that if, if that's the case, that you know, the, the accountable um, mechanisms are there, do you think that they are working sufficiently well? Or is there a need for reforming some of the processes of accountability? I think, that, I, I think there can be a conflict between some of the um, existing measures of accountability and um, the... Well, I think some of the um, you know some of the issues around, um, for example, um, some of the, the you know the targets in, in waiting times can dictate a particular performance, which if they weren't there, might lead to other focus um, or, or other opportunities. Um, so that's just one example of where that um, that might be relevant. But you know we have to be certain and satisfied that the accountability mechanisms that we have are appropriate to deliver the type of approach and performance that we that we want to achieve. Which raises an interesting question about how appropriate uh, setting uh, national targets are. And if, if, if a government has made uh, commitments on specific targets, and we've all been guilty of uh, talking in terms of targets, does that take away from some of the um, ability to home in on other areas of measurement and improvement that might actually help the delivery of some of the aspects of what um, the Christie Commission was recommending? I don't think it stops the creation of a focus on, um, uh, on, on performance in general. I don't think that. Uh, I think it might be an obstacle to generating the necessary shift in activity or, or focus to enable that to be the case. Um, and there can be a mismatch between some of the, the things that we measure and some of the things that we want to achieve. And those are often two different things. I, I think one of the things that struck me very much in the uh, first wave of COVID was how magnificently well 
uh, our hospitals responded to the intense pressure that was on them. And I heard more than once that that was down to the fact that doctors and nurses were taking the frontline decisions about the COVID wards and how they had to be organised, rather than some of the um, people who are normally associated with administration of health services. And that, that's an area which I think is particularly uh, relevant to the running of Scotland. To what extent do we uh, need to move towards a system of accountability that is more in the hands of people who are actually running the frontline services rather than those people who are actually administering them? Um, well, I think there's a, there's a number of dimensions to that. Uh, and one that we can't ignore is, is Parliament and, uh, and political debate. Because, you know, um, I... I uh, I can't control what members of Parliament raise as the issues that are of concern to them and the things that they want to pursue. But, you know, I, I sit and I listen to uh, questions and debates in Parliament on a daily basis, and I hear members of Parliament, frankly, railing against what Liz Smith has just put to me as a question, because members of Parliament want ministers to be taking these decisions or accountable for these decisions. So... It's all very well for an argument to be put forward that says we should empower the frontline professionals. Um, but then, when it comes to parliamentary questions and debates, a completely opposite approach is taken by members of parliament. If I give an example, I just completed five years as Education Secretary. One of my biggest priorities was to uh, encourage and support um, a much greater empowerment of uh, of schools within our community and uh, of head teachers, but it didn't stop members of parliament pressing me about the, the performance of the education system across the board, including, if I may say so, uh, the former Conservative education so. spokesperson, uh, whom I respect uh, uh, and admire deeply. Um, but you know, that's so. I, I, I think there's a. I think there's a. Um, uh, there's a conundrum in there. Uh, which Parliament itself has to resolve as well um, about what, what, we want, what Parliament wants to think is important and, uh, and, and, and should be the subject of scrutiny. And just one final question for me. Um, I think this is a really interesting argument, though, because um, one of the things that we had in that session on the 9th of November with uh, Professor Mitchell um, and the Auditor General was this question of trust and that... Trust in politics these days, well, and this is not a party political point, trust is not easily found. Um, and yet the public, I think, wants to have that level of trust in people who are delivering their public services, whether that's in education and health and transport, whatever it might be. And at the moment, pol politics is not in a good place, partly because of the COVID situation, which obviously is nobody's fault at all. But I think it's quite hard to find a lot of uh, the, the same degree of trust that we had in, in systems before, and dare I say, sometimes in politicians. And, and what, what I think is at the core of this um, debate is to what extent can we improve the level of trust if the lines of accountability are proven to be pretty watertight and people understand why decisions have been made and what can, uh, what can they do about it to make sure that you know, these decisions are the right ones in order to deliver their public services? Do you, do you think that's a debate that we need to um, foster? I, think I, 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 don't, I don't think I really accept the premise of Liz Smith's question because you know, the, 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 on the question of trust in our public services and trust in the political system because you know, long-standing, reputable um, uh, surveys of public opinion, principally the Scottish Social Attitude Survey, which um, uh, some of your um, the witnesses that you gave evidence that gave evidence to you three weeks ago would be well familiar, um, essentially show very strong and high levels of public trust in public services and in the, the system of government within Scotland. Uh, so I think that's and that's. At very, very high levels and much higher levels compared to the situation in the rest of the United Kingdom. Where I think there is a, an, an important question is about making sure that there is clear um, a, a understanding of the rationale for certain decision making in the delivery of public services. 
And this is where we do get into difficult territory because, you know, I, I've sat through over my years some tricky discussions about the delivery of health care, for example, um, where um, the rationale for making a particular change in the delivery of service is explained from a clinical perspective and it can make very strong rational sense. Um, but then it conflicts perhaps with how it's been done in the past and how people feel about location services and all these questions. And that gets very, very difficult. And I think the answer to that is about good, clear, engaged processes. Last point I would add to this question, I, sh I should have added this to, to, to the earlier question that Liz Smith asked me about the role of professionals. Any decent performing public sector organisation should be listening to its frontline professionals. Should be listening to them and responding. And, it, and it, if, if somebody who's running an accident in the emergency department says, look, I think it would be better if we organised it this way rather than that way. Uh, you know, as a public sector leader, I'd be hard pressed to say, well, I think I know better than you do. And so I think any organisation should really be listening to its frontline people. Thank you. Thank you. John, to be followed by Ross. Uh, thanks very much, convener. I mean, maybe to continue that theme, um, I mean, you gave the example yourself of, I think, Aberfeldy and good things that were happening there. And this whole tension between local, uh, which I think was a Christie uh, principle, empowerment, that kind of thing, um, against this idea of uniformity and a criticism of a postcode lottery. And, I mean, even your, your final example there, so the accident the emergency people in Glasgow might suggest doing something and they do it one way, but in Edinburgh or Aberdeen it's done a different way. I mean, can we really square that circle or is it just inevitable that some people will always say it's too centralised and some people will say it's a postcode lottery? I, I, I think there's fundamental conundrums in there that are difficult to resolve. You know, one, 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 you know, one person's, um, one person's uh, local flexibility is another person's postcode lottery. And it's as blunt as that. And, uh, and now, I think some of that then comes back to the point the convener put to me, which was, if you're faced with good, robust evidence that what you are doing could be improved if you followed the example that is going on in another locality, I, I struggle to get my head around that, that you would resist that, where another locality is demonstrating we can get a better outcome by doing this in a particular way. And I think, to be fair to a lot of public sector organisations, there is a lot of learning goes on in that respect. Um, but if there is a, a discernible, evidenced amount of progress we made elsewhere, and you're resistant to that, I think that takes a wee bit of... That needs a bit of challenge. Yes, but, I mean, presumably, you know, while Shetland might learn some things from Greater Glasgow Health Board, they're not going to learn it, follow everything that Greater Glasgow Health Board does. No. Um, I mean, another area was uh, from Christie was working together effectively, and one of the things I think that came out of that was the uh, IJBs, or Health and Social Care Partnerships. And, I mean, I did ask the witnesses this previously in the 9th of November. You know, from my perspective, we've now got three bodies, whereas we used to have two. So that, you know, I used to either go to the Health Board or the Council with an issue uh, or case, and now... I can go to the Health Board or the Council or the Health and Social Care Partnership. Is, is it a good example? I mean, has it worked or is it a bad example of working together in that we've created another organisation? I, 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 I think it's beneficial because I think what it's doing is it's, it's creating the space for a very focused discussion on the needs of individuals. So. If, if you have a constituency, if Mr Mason has a constituency case, which, um, and I've had these cases that don't fit neatly into the health board compartment or the local authority compartment, and one of the big lessons I've learned in my political life, and especially in my life as a minister, is that nothing fits neatly into one single compartment, uh, hardly ever. Um, the health and social care partnerships I think have got the 
structures and the ethos to focus on the needs of, um, of individuals and to find solutions for those individuals. Now, there will be a lot of practical impediments in resolving that, but I think that uh, provides the necessary focus. Yeah, so, so you are positive about the health and social care partnerships, yeah? Yes. Okay. And the, the third area I wanted to touch on was, you've, you've kind of touched on it yourself as well, as to, you know, getting Parliament and both committees and in the Chamber, you know, to sign up to the idea of preventative spend. I mean, I mean, there still seems to be an emphasis, you know, and, and, and you can understand the emphasis on A&E waiting times or ambulance waiting times or some of these kind of things, but I mean, that is not, you know, that's kind of going against. I mean, that, then the, the temptation or the pressures on government to put more money into A&E, whereas that's exactly the opposite of preventative spend. Um, is Parliament partly responsible for the lack of movement towards preventative spend? I think there's got to be a, you know, there's, there's got to be a balance in all these considerations. That there is absolutely uh, a necessary place and purpose for accident and emergency services and for them to be operating in a highly efficient fashion because that will deliver the best patient outcomes. Uh, I suppose the challenge is to make sure that for that system, however, to work most effectively when somebody really, really needs accident and emergency, they've got to be able to get it and to get it quickly, which therefore makes the point that whilst, yes, we support having vibrant and effective A&E services, We've also got to have effective social care packages to avoid unnecessary cases ending up in A&E because there isn't a social care package available in the home. So I think part of the lesson I would draw, deduce from all of this is that there is, a, um, there is a need for us to look at these questions on a whole systems basis. It's part of the point I've been making in... You know, I was, when I answered questions for the First Minister a few weeks ago and I was questioned about the ambulance service, all of my answers were about the fact this was a whole systems challenge. It wasn't just about the compartment called the ambulance service. It was the, the, the compartment called the ambulance service was affected by what was going on in a whole range of other compartments within our public services. So the need for collaboration and cooperation of the style that the Christie Commission argued for is central to resolving some of these um, the, the, the more the, 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 the more um, sort of high profile questions such as ambulance or any waiting times yeah I mean I agree with a lot of that I mean I suppose they're high profile because politicians make them high profile but they're also easier to measure than you know what we're doing in the communities but I mean we keep coming back to this disinvestment question that you know if we're going to try and put more into primary care or community care or whatever where's the money going to come from I mean one of the witnesses said well could we use our tax or borrowing powers to to have a kind of one off investment but because otherwise I mean, one of my suggestions was, can we take 1% off the, the hospitals and put, it, put that into community care? But, you know, I suspect that would not help accident and emergency waiting times. I mean, I think we had the case many years ago in, in America, one of the states, they just didn't build a prison and put the money into youth, you know, supporting youth and that kind of thing. But it did mean that for a sh in the short term, you know, the prisons were overcrowded and there was a problem with that. Uh, the, the, these are... These dilemmas are at the heart of every budget process the government, and if I may say so, Parliament has to go through. So um, I think there are obviously a range of options that are available to, to ministers. The borrowing option is, quite, is fairly limited in terms of what the government is able to do. But um, there are financial options available to government, but Parliament's got to endorse the, the, the budget. So when it comes to what the Finance Secretary announces on the 9th of December. You know, members of Parliament need to reflect on that. And, and if, if members of Parliament believe, for example, that there is a need for us to be um, disinvesting in one area of policy to invest in another area of policy, then the opportunity is avail available for them to come forward with those amendments uh, to the budget process. And you know, that, that option is available to members. But the government obviously makes a judgment based on what we think is a reasonable balance across all these factors. But it's up to any member of parliament to come forward with an alternative proposition. 
Okay, so finally, has, has any member or party or committee ever asked you to take money out of acute services and put it into preventative services? No. Thank you. <laughs> no. Chronic, maybe? No? Okay, uh, Ross, we followed by Douglas. Uh, thanks, Convener. I'd like to return to the, the point around accountability, and specifically I'm interested in the, the Government's position on the role of the boards of the various public bodies and NDPBs. It seems that the, there's a variety of roles that the board of a public body could play. There's a, a kind of bog-standard corporate governance uh, issue where what they focus on are you know, issues like um, HR practice, etc. Or they could look more at operational policy decisions of the, the body that, uh, that they're responsible for. So the example I used with a, a, a previous session was the Board of Creative Scotland is largely made up of professionals from the, the creative industries who have an understanding of, of that area of public policy compared to um, an issue you'll be familiar with, Cabinet Secretary, the Board of the SQA. Um, it has a teacher on it, but it has three management consultants on it. Now, that, that would be entirely legitimate if the purpose of the Board of Public Bodies was to focus on corporate governance issues like, for example, um, HR. But it seems to me that there's, there's an inconsistency um, across Scotland between how various public bodies, uh, the boards of various public bodies, understand their, their function, their purpose. What's the government's position on the, the purpose of these boards? I, I think the, I would be deeply concerned if a public body struggle to understand its function and purpose, because that's absolutely fundamental to how any public body needs to operate. So I, I, I would be concerned about that, deeply concerned about it. Uh, and that should all be well set out to a board, either through statute or through a letter of direction. So, for example, if I go back to my days in, not a letter of direction, that's the wrong term, um, a, well, I'm going to, I'll, I'll, I won't get the right term, but it's the one example I want to cite is every year I would send Scottish Enterprise um, a, a management letter. We'll, have to, we'll tell the committee what it's properly called. I just can't remember what it's called. Um, letter of guidance is what I've been offered. I'm not altogether sure that's the right one, David, but we'll, 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 get, we'll get you the right terminology. But it's essentially, this is what I want you to focus on. In your, in your priorities and policy priorities. So I would send that to Scottish Enterprise and HIE on an annual basis when I was the Finance Secretary. Now, the example of... So that's about general parameters of operation. Um, the example that Mr Greer gives me about Creative Scotland is a slightly different one because th there's some really very active funding decisions that Creative Scotland has take, uh, takes which are designed by statute to be taken at arm's length from government without operational influence of government to respect artistic freedom and decision making. So there, there, there's quite a, a very specific type of arm's length relationship with Creative Scotland. So the, the, the function and purpose of a board should be absolutely clear. Um, if it's required by statute, it should be operating within that statute. And if it requires this letter of guidance from ministers, then it should be operating within that letter of guidance. I think there's a, a different and distinctive point that Mr Greer puts to me, which is about the composition of these boards. And I think that's perhaps a, that's a, that's a different question about whether or not, you know, what are the selection criteria for boards? Because essentially, to make sure that board appointments are made on the basis of um, capacity and capability, a lot of these boards will not have specifics about, you know, you must have X number of teachers or you must have Y number of lecturers or whatever it happens to be. It, it will be about attributes. So there may be requirements about financial competence, um, legal competence, you know, boards have to have a chair of an audit committee, for example. So somebody's got to have audit competence. So th there'll be the, the, there may be a wider debate that Parliament might want to have about some of the attributes of boards, which I think would more directly address the point that Mr Greer puts to me. I think that, yeah, that would certainly be the case, and it's certainly my view that Parliament hasn't been as effective as we could have been in, in the scrutiny of the, the boards of various public bodies, 
that being said, there's always more that Parliament could do than it's ever going to have the, the capacity to. But taking the, the example that you give of Scottish Enterprise and, and the letter of guidance, so w would it then be at core to the purpose of the board of Scottish Enterprise, separate from the, the senior management team, those who are actually uh, delivering, uh, who, are, who are operating the organisation, is it core to the, uh, the purpose of the board to scrutinise how effectively the organisation and through its senior management team have delivered on what was in uh, your letter of guidance in terms of strategic priorities, or is the purpose of the board to scrutinise the internal governance of the organisation, al almost divorced from the purpose of the organisation in the same way that they would for any other public body? No, the, no, the, 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 you know, the, the, you know, if, 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 if I carry on my, my Scottish Enterprise example, um, if I sent a letter of guidance to the chair of Scottish Enterprise and then I saw Scottish Enterprise not delivering the direction I wanted, the first conversation would be between me and the chair of Scottish Enterprise to say what's going on. Um, so, you know, that's so the board is as accountable for the direction of the organisation and the delivery of its purpose as the senior management team. The senior management team have got to turn it into operational reality. But um, the board is just as responsible and accountable for the direction and to, and to address the issues that are, are, are set out from ministers entirely within the statutory right of ministers. From your experience of government, do you think all boards are held equally accountable by ministers? There's a very substantial number of public bodies. Some ministers are responsible for a very substantial uh, proportion of them. Those like Scottish Enterprise or the SQA or Creative Scotland, these are the very high profile public bodies that uh, a, lot, a large section of the population will have some interaction with. There's a number of others that perhaps fall into the, the background a little bit. From your experience of government, at ministerial level, is there sufficiently consistent scrutiny of the, the performance of boards? I think there will be, yes, but it will, it will vary in intensity given, the, given the, the, the significance of the issues that are at stake. Um, so I think it, and, and, and it will inevitably depend upon where the policy focus is and where um, the, the, you know, and what the issues that are arising out of the nature of events that are taking place, uh, that that will vary. But uh, you know, there is, if statute requires ministers to interact with a public body in a particular way, then ministers should operate in that fashion. If statute says to ministers, you've got to keep a distance from these boards, then ministers should keep a distance from these boards because that's what statute says. So it will vary depending on what statute requires. And just one final question, if there's time, Convener. Um, do, do you believe that there is sufficient turnover uh, on the, the boards of, of public bodies? And, and by that, I mean uh, those who have uh, active experience um, on a board or not. I'm, I'm aware that there, there are a number of individuals who um, move from the board of one public body to the board of another and for a, a continuous period of time will be involved in corporate uh, governance of, of public sector bodies. Is, is there a high enough turnover... Uh, within Scotland as a whole for us to be bringing in those who um, have perhaps, whether it's direct experience of the, the industry that the, the board works with or some other relevant kind of experience, um, or could we, could we do with a little bit more scrutiny of the, an individual's length of service across public sector governance rather than just uh, the individual board that they might be serving on at any given time? I think we could do with a broader range of people expertise and capabilities coming forward for our public bodies. Thank you. That's all for me, Convener. Thank you very much. Uh, Douglas, to be followed by Michelle. Thanks, Convener. Um, in my um, mind, um, Cabinet Secretary, you know, the Local Governance Review is the opportunity to break down some of the silos you, you spoke about earlier. Um, I guess is that your view as well? And when will we see the Local Governance Review coming through? And is there lessons learned from the pandemic that will feed into that review as well? There's definitely lessons to be learned from the pandemic because I think what um, I think the hard reality that we have to accept about the pandemic is that the degree of change in the delivery of services and approaches by a whole range of public bodies took place at a pace that I have never seen before in my life welcome change. Uh, I wish I'd seen a bit more of it in my time. Um, but uh, 
So it demonstrates it can be done. And I think that's the crucial point. Why does it have to be done? Well, it has to be done. It had to be done because we had an absolute public health emergency to which countless organisations, countless organisations, disrespected boundaries, worked at pace, found solutions, and I think generally did all they could to support citizens. They wrapped services round people. Um, the question that arises for me out of that is that if we could do that because of the COVID emergency, what's stopping us about child poverty, for example, or the climate emergency, for another example? So I think there is, I, I, I think there's a, so it, should, it shows it can be done, but I think we've also got to be open eyed about the fact that it's, we have to really make sure that the conditions are right to make sure it can happen in other circumstances. It happened in March 2020 because we faced a public health crisis. Um, we have to make sure that the same thought conditions and processes enable us to do that. Now, um, so, the, so lessons have to be learned there, um, good lessons. And then I think also the, in terms of the local governance review, uh, there are a number of ideas that have emerged about how we might be able to respond to some of the issues raised by local authorities and to local communities in that respect, which the government's reflecting on. And uh, I think out of that, uh, we, uh, you know, we, we need to take forward uh, dialogue with partners about how best we can turn many of these propositions into practical reality. And, and I guess, um, you know, I think what often creates barriers and silos is, is the money at the end of the day and it's back to the shift in resources and, and during the pandemic I think there was a lot more flexibility I think but you know we'll, we'll, we'll worry about the, the cash after let's just look after our um, communities so I'm just trying to think of as a, a way going forward where almost as like an SLA in place between and I, and I hate even thinking about that, but you know, between NHS and local authorities, for example, you know, I was trying to think of some examples when when you were talking about um, youth justice. You know, you know, if local authorities could spend more on that, then there would be a savings for probably police and justice uh, in the future. And then things like sports facilities. If, if local authorities could spend more on that, there could be a um, you know reduction in obesity and then savings to NHS going forward. I'm just trying to think of as a way of sort of linking the outcome that would help an organisation back to who was actually doing that early intervention, spending the money, you know, so as a, as a balance there? I, th I, think the, I think the answer to this question is that a variety of... Pub I agree fundamentally with the point that Mr Lumsden puts to me, but I think a variety of public sector organisations have to focus more on the collective interest than the silo interest in addressing some of these questions. Let me provide an example. I, was, um, I visited a, a primary school in um, Midlothian, and the, it was a, a new-build primary school. And, but what the local authority had decided to do um, in partnership with the health board, there was an existing sports centre. And what they had... They'd, essentially, they kept the sports centre there, but in a combined procurement heaven forfend, they built a GP practice on one end of the sports centre, they built a primary school on the other end, they built a library and a concourse in the middle. So there was the door, you, it's a separate door for the primary school, for obviously for security issues, but there was this general door you came in, which gave into a concourse area where there was a GP practice here, a sports facility here, a library there, and what emerged, a wee bit of a cafe in the foyer. And GPs were saying to some patients, I'm going to, I think you need to go next door to the leisure class in there, and there's a wee bit of an exercise class going on. And once you've done that, you know, and then folk were then going into the library and they were having a cuppy before they went home. So you had multiple benefits of access to GP services in the locality, um, access to uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions, exercise arrangements, um, access to literary services and some socialisation. So multiple benefits. Now, what I couldn't do 
is sit down here and say, now, the savings to the NHS were as follows, because there was fewer prescriptions or whatever. But I think we could all look at that and say, that feels like a good outcome. And members of the public said to me uh, when I was there that um, there was a particular joy in seeing all the kids coming in and going to the library and the hubbub and the joy of all that noise. So, I think the, the, the the ethos of the Christie Commission of saying to us you must find common platforms for collaboration is what resulted in that venture in, in Midlothian. Um, but I think we need to have more of that systemic thinking across. And there'll be other examples. Mr. Lumsden will, be fam will have, Aber will have there'll be Aberdeen examples of exactly the same thing. Uh, so um, to, to, to try to in, in, uh, enhance and address that uh, pattern of delivery. Yeah, no, you're right. I was thinking of the Tilly Drone Hub in Aberdeen. That uh, was a, a great collaboration. I'm just trying to think how we, you know, what's holding, holding us back from having more of that? Is that a finance thing? Is it, or is it more, you know, banging heads together? What, what's holding us back? I, I, I think undoubtedly um, compartmentalised budgeting will be a challenge. That's one issue. Another will be um, lining up. Um, procurement processes to make sure they can all arrive on the same day, that will be a challenge because different organisations will perhaps have different levels of financial um, security to be able to take forward. Um, and then also there will be whether or not there is the necessary perspective and vision to imagine some of these concepts. Uh, I, I, I dare say when the Midlothian example um, or the Tilly Drone example were being conceived of, there might have been a wee bit of kind of, oh really, um, are we sure we can pull this off type of thinking, but it needs vision and commitment to make sure that can happen. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks, Camino. Okay, thank you, Michelle, to be followed by Daniel. Uh, good morning. I think perhaps there's been a process of osmosis because I was going to be asking about similar areas of you. I mean, I think what, what we've been exploring this morning is that, that, you know, over the past 10 years of Christie, we've tended to see evolution rather than revolution. And there's been comments made about the setting up of uh, the, the social care elements that it gave the opportunity to develop a new vision removed from both existing culture and existing processes. And that has regarded being successful. And that does then lead us on to where we are now with, with post-pandemic and the, the area you highlight about how public sector bodies came together and rules were broken or pushed to get to the right outcomes. Perhaps that's a, I don't mean rules were broken, but, but certainly a focus to get to bold outcomes. So I suppose what I want to just explore a bit further is how culturally that can be continued, linking back to Christie principles, in particular empowerment, how government can enable that. And you've touched a wee bit earlier in the blockers around... Uh, budgeting, I think. But I'd like you to flesh that out a bit more about how we can continue this. The, 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 I, think it's, I think, frankly, that's the $64 million question. And that, that, that's the... So my response to Michelle Thompson's question is largely the thinking that's in the COVID recovery strategy, because we have been explicit in that strategy the type of atmosphere and ethos and thinking that brought public servants together in the fashion that they did in the spring of 2020 to deliver these solutions is the type of ethos and thinking that we require to meet some of the wider challenges and fundamentally for in the government's programme those are around child poverty and the climate emergency so those are those two substantive themes they will not be solved in neat little compartments. They will require the same collaboration, cooperation, ethos, transcending of boundaries to ensure they can be achieved. At the heart of the COVID recovery strategy, we make the point that that is what we need to essentially encourage. I, I suppose that what I'm trying to do in the COVID recovery strategy is actually empower people to g give them authorization. Yeah, uh, you know, encouragement, permission, even, to actually say, well, this, this is welcome. And I think, I, I don't think we can, um, I don't think we can underestimate 
the degree to which people might feel the need to have permission. And maybe that's actually a point I should have included in my answer to Mr. In Mr. Lumsden's questions, that, that, that the sense of needing to have permission might actually be an impediment to people making some of this progress. I remember a conversation I had with a, a care worker in, uh, in the Highlands, and in, in the Highland, Highland uh, Local Authority area, um, they took a decision when it came to the integration of health and social care that um, the health board would take responsibility for um, months either el uh, adult care or children's care, and the local authority would take leadership for the other. So whichever way, I can't remember which way around it is. And I had a conversation with a, a healthcare worker, and I said, what, what's, the, what's the biggest impact this has had on you? And she said to me, um, it means I can do what I need to do for the member of the public I'm supporting without being bollocked or fearing being bollocked for spending health board money on a local authority priority. Now, that's about permission. And you know, that lady was able to say to me, all this grandiose architecture for her meant she could focus on the member of the public she was supporting and do the right thing. As opposed to thinking, well, this is maybe going to involve me spending money that I'm not really that, it's not really in my bailiwick, that should be the health board paying for that or whatever. And I think we've got to get beyond some of that thinking. Yeah, and that kind of licensed operate leads me on to uh, the next area. I mean, you set out the sort of three themes that you were focusing on, one of which was good green jobs. And I wanted to just explore how you see that emboldened licensed operate permission interfacing with private sector business who perhaps traditionally will have more of this kind of behavioural element. Have you actively considered that uh, within whether you're revisiting NPF 4 or so on? But that is worthy of merit and consideration just now, I think. How, how, um, how public sector organisations relate to and deal with um, uh, private sector organisations is an element that you know, is a relationship that public sector organisations have got to think about carefully. Um, I think what the, what the COVID recovery strategy aims to do is to, if you take, for example, the first theme of um, tackling the financial insecurity of low-income households, one of the ways to do that is by doing what the government has said it's going to do, of doubling the child payment. But another way is by making sure that parents, once you provide early learning and childcare, might be able to gain access to some of the good, green, fair jobs that are around. And that will obviously help to strengthen financial, to address financial insecurity of low-income households. So it's about making sure, I certainly hope, that out of the COVID recovery strategy, um, a private sector organisation would, a private sector organisation would look at that and say, "Well, there's a place, there's a role for us to perform here. We can make a contribution here by um, you know, taking forward our investment plans, collaborating with the with public organisations on training of, of members of staff, and creating employment." And the virtuous circle carries on. Just last wee question. You said in your opening remarks it was the first time I'd heard the term referred to in terms of Christie was around ethical. Um, and there's often a dichotomy uh, with ethics where organisations, rather than focusing on consequentialist outcomes, i.e. the kind of end result, will focus on deontological, i.e. process-driven outcomes. And I was just intrigued by your use of the word ethical. Is that something that you started to reflect further on, or has that always been there and I've missed it? Or it's just I hadn't heard the use of the, the term in relation to this before. I think it's a. I, I, I think it's it's not a word I've used often about this, but I, I felt it was appropriate to use it because fundamentally, when I think about. The Christie Commission report, I think the Christie Commission report is a highly ethically based report. Um, I, I, I was, you know, I, I, it had a profound impact on me. I found it, uh, you know, the moment we commissioned that report, there was a great debate about what was the role of public, what, what was the proper role of public services. And Christie may not have used the word ethical, but 
Christie provided us with an ethical justification for the maintenance of public services. There was a great debate going on at the time about whether all of this should be privatised and what's the degree of private involvement. But the reason why I thought it was appropriate to use the word now is that when I look at some of the issues that we've been wrestling with for some time around fair work, around the transition to a green economy, about the more sustainable use of resources, I think that reinforces the ethical purpose of the Christie Commission. Thank you, Convener. The only way is ethics. Daniel? Um, Deputy First Minister, you've always struck me as someone that has been frustrated about the pace of change. And I was really interested in your opening remarks. You, you hinted at something. You, you said that, that on reflection, or that we should reflect, that, that many of the things in Christie had not become as bedded as much as we'd have liked, either institutionally or, or in terms of policy. So l let me ask you this in an expansive uh, way. If the 2007 John Swinney was to come forward in the future, would he be um, uh, pleased or frustrated about the lack of institutional change? And if the 2021 uh, John Swinney could, could provide that John Swinney with some advice, what would it be? Well... Um, uh, I, 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 I feel as if, uh, uh, to go back to Liz Smith's question about the apparent lack of accountability in the system, <laughs> I feel as if uh, I'm being invited to reflect on my, um, my term in office as a minister. I think the, I think the, I, 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 I would freely concede that there are a lot of institutional barriers to making progress. There, and we shouldn't underestimate the challenges that exist in any government about compartmentalisation. It's not actually about any government. You know, I, I worked for a, a large um, private sector insurance company before I entered Parliament in the 1990s. It had its own compartments. Its leadership wrestled with you know, the, the necessity to focus on, on, in their case, customers and to avoid focus on process and structures. So I don't think it's, a, it's, not, a, it's not a challenge that's unique to, um, to public sector organisations or to governments. I think what you need to have, however, is um, a, a, a universal approach or an agreed approach which enables you to overcome some of those barriers. And I think the Christie Commission helps us by giving us an approach and a methodology and a set of principles that can be followed in whatever public sector organisation you're operating. Um, and I think in that respect, Christie has really stood the test of time because, as I said in my opening remarks, the Christie approach remains fundamental to what we are doing today and what public sector organisations are doing today. If you look at the promise, the thinking behind the promise is essentially a development of the thinking that was in the Christie Commission. So, uh, I, I, what I would... I suppose what the 2021 John Swinney would say to the 2007 John Swinney is there is... Um, don't underestimate the scale of the obstacles to be overcome. Would probably be the best advice I could offer. I, I, I'm almost tempted to say that I, I might ask that question in private and see what uh, response I get. But I, 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 mean, I wonder if actually one of the things there, and I think I, I, mean, I, I recognise what you're saying, I think compartmentalisation is, is an issue. And, and part of it is about, I think, putting the, the right levers in, 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 in the right places and making sure that they're not split up. And, and with that in mind, you know, do we need to have a more fundamental reappraisal of what, what is under the control of local government? And, uh, and well, you know, Douglas Lumsden has you know, alluded to the local government review. That's very much about how local government engages with people and, and how it makes decisions rather than what it is doing. And if you take the example you gave of the, the library and the, the, the sports, uh, the, 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 the sports centre and the primary school and the health centre being in one place, actually one of the best play, ways that you could, you, could, you could make that sort of thing happen more is by making sure that those decisions were all coming together in one place rather than split apart. So, you know, 
and again, if I was, if I was going to sort of, in, in line with my previous question, you know, my, my, sort of, sort of my slightly more impudent way of asking the question, why do we treat Douglas and Liz's colleagues from 1994 with such respect that, that, that we, we assume that Mr Lang's local government reforms were perfectly formed and, and should remain unaltered uh, by both his government but frankly m mine. I mean, should we not be asking a much more fundamental question? Is, is the solution to this not pushing as much decision making down to a local level and giving local government the powers they need to exercise them properly? Um, well, there's, 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 a, there's a lot in there. Um, the, the first point I would, I would make, uh, just to follow on my, my last uh, answer, is that um, I think actually the challenge of compartmentalisation is less acute in the Scottish Government than it is in, in Whitehall, for example. I don't say that to be critical. I, just, it's, I think it's a, an acknowledgement of the, the fact that we are... The, the benefits of size and proximity enable us to, you know, if I want to sort out, and going back to some of the issues we talked about there about COVID, if I wanted to sort out the issues about compartmentalisation affecting our, our review of COVID, you know, people were on a phone call within five minutes, the necessary people, and it was getting aired and sorted and addressed. Now, my colleagues and counterparts in the UK government often say to me, you know, it's much easier for you, you can just bang the heads together readily compared to us. It's much more complex. And there's a fair amount of truth in that. So there are opportunities for us in that respect. And it's actually a topic that I'm discussing with our incoming permanent secretary about how we can advance some of these uh, issues about uh, uh, overcoming boundaries and barriers. Second point I'd make is that you, Mr Johnson puts to me about the, the need for us to be focused on... Um, sort of wider purposes and, and, and I think we've tried to do that with the establishment of the national performance framework which is designed to provide us with you know a sense of direction over a longer period of time and that's designed to give public organizations a sense of where we're heading and what we might be achieving there is however a natural conflict between some of the aspirations in the national performance framework and some of the accountability mechanisms that will that will be applied operationally and which Parliament might actually spend quite a bit of time um, scrutinising as well. And then lastly, I come to the, you know, the, the colossal question, which is about the role of local government and um, whether the, the 1994 reforms were absolutely perfect um, or um, what's the best way through this. I think there's, there's a number of elements to that. Um, one of them is that, and it relates to... to to the, the the optimum level of delivery of services to individuals is that, that that's never a kind of perfect question at local level. If you look at the health and social care reforms that we were talking about, we've essentially tried to recognise that although local government may have responsibility for um, social care uh, or social work, that the health service has got responsibility for health. There's a thing called social care, which doesn't neatly fall into local government or health. It can be a, you know, every individual case can be at different stages on the spectrum. So the health and social care reforms are designed to address that need for collaboration between the health service and local government. Um, you, you then get into other questions about... Um, the natural desire for communities to be more, um, to have more control over what happens in their locality, um, but sometimes, you know, I'm not sure all of that is determined by how close they feel to their local authority. You know, if I take citizens that I represent in the town of Blair Gowrie, um, whether the council's in, located in Perth or Dundee, they, they think both. You know, both of these places feel quite distant from them. Um, so, in, in terms of what really matters to them about their absolute locality. Um, and then, finally, there's the question of Parliament, because your local government, if I go back to my example about education, um, 
and I, and I, underst yeah, I understand why this is the case. Um, I'm not complaining about it. But fundamentally, the levers to affect performance of the education system lie with local authorities. But as Mr Johnson might have observed over the last five years, I'm held quite, and my successor is held quite closely accountable for the decisions, for, for the performance of education, a large proportion of which is not within the operational responsibility of ministers. Now, that, that's now in the health service, it's, it's different because there's ultimate ministerial um, control and appointments. But um, I think Parliament has to, you know, Parliament would have to be involved in a discussion about where the right amount of um, accountability lies on some of these questions. Yeah, so just a final question, and, and uh, there would be a bridging question, because I think there's an interesting point around the natural level for things like education and health, and whether that they're in the same place. But uh, the, the, the point... I think that is a legitimate question, and it's not just about that question. There's a, there's a, there's, there's almost a, there's almost a philosophical debate, which needs to be had if one is going down this route of exploring this question about where is the right level for a particular subject to be determined. Because if I, if I look at some of the issues that I still wrestle with around child protection, for example. There are some very, very sophisticated, some very sophisticated knowledge is required about the approaches to child protection, which you have to be certain about in all localities of the country. But clearly, we do not have a national system of child protection. But you have to be satisfied that the right level of child protection exists in every single locality in the country. And that might and we have local authorities that range from having populations of twenty five thousand to a million. And clearly there are they, they can support different levels of expertise to enable us to be assured that that level of protection is available in all circumstances. I did one more question, but I think the convener was, was wanting to come in at the end. So, one more. Okay. Can I just ch challenge you on, on one point? Um, is that you, I think, uh, uh, in response to Liz Smith, and, and I think this sort of similar point was alluded to uh, in, your, in response to Ross Greer, that sort of being accountable to ministers, you know, whether that's health boards or, or, or NDPBs, was sufficient accountability. And I would just challenge whether accountability to ministers is the, the same as public accountability because in, in terms of public accountability there is an intermediary layer we can hold ministers to account in parliament but we can't hold health boards directly accountable uh, and, and and there's a there's a, a difference uh, with that and that all, and, 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 and in, in some ways a, a frustration uh, within our democracy I, 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 I hope I didn't create the sense that the, 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 the characterisation that Mr Johnson's put to me was how I answered that question, because I, I don't think, I think that there's, there's countless accountability, in informal statutory accountability, that may well be the relationship, but there are many other channels of accountability that must be performed by a range of different organisations. If you take a, a health board example, for example, the um, health ministers will undertake an annual um, a public scrutiny of individual health boards, which will take place and um, can be seen by members of the public and, and they can be engaged in that process. So, you know, there's, there's a whole variety of different accountability mechanisms that can be put in place in that respect. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. I think the John Swinney of 2021, if he went back to 2007, would tell his predecessor that he was yet to reach his prime. <laughs> right. He says... Sukili. Um, he should give shorter answers, um, but uh, it would only lead to more questions. Um, just one final one, really, for me. We've got 128 non-departmental public bodies in Scotland, 32 local authorities. We've got health boards, we've got health and social care partnerships, community planning partnerships, city and regional deals. And, you know, 
my view is that the level of public understanding of how those uh, work together is probably south of 1% of the, the population. And you talked about optimum service delivery in, in one of your answers to, to Daniel Jones. I'm just wondering, I realise there's, there's vested interests, etc., and things are difficult to move structurally, but is there a case for decluttering um, the landscape? It's interesting, Convener, when you, you know, I recall going back to 2007 that we took steps to declutter and we removed a range of public bodies. We passed the um, public, ref uh, public Bodies Reform Act and uh, as a consequence of that some further rationalisation work was undertaken. And then I suppose over time um, different reforms come forward that perhaps move in the opposite direction. So I think the, 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 there is an argument for keeping these questions under, uh, under review um, and as to whether further actions are required. I think the other point I would make is that there is also uh, always um, I, I, something we've got to be mindful of in relation to the question of structural reform, that when you undertake structural reform, you have to be aware of the, 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 the it's probably the likelihood of disruption to service delivery that goes on at the same time. Um, and you know, I think uh, I, I wasn't uh, a member of parliament at the time of the local government reorganisation in 1995-96, but you know, I do remember the period feeling very much as if there was you know, there was a, a, a lot of focus on that, uh, or more focus on that than perhaps was on some of the uh, aspects of service delivery. So you've got to be mindful of these questions when you're undertaking structural reform. You know, I appreciate that. I was a councillor at the time in Strathclyde, you know, went from one local authority to 12, which meant 12 new social work directors, 12 deputy social work directors, etc, etc. And uh, all these structures that had to be put in place. But uh, I mean, uh, I, I do think that is an area that we have to really keep under review, because I do think that there can be a disconnect between the, the, the people of Scotland and indeed uh, these uh, these uh, different structures, if they become and it become impossible to understand, uh, even for elected representatives, uh, you know, I, I, it can be hazy if uh, if there are so many and they're, they're overlapping. Anyway, I wish to thank the, the Deputy First Minister and his officials for their evidence today. The next item on our agenda is a private work programme. I'd also like to update members on some uh, areas of uh, interest and importance. Uh, so I now close the public part of the meeting. We'll reconvene in a couple of minutes.